Well, good evening. Uh, I'm Warren Hogue, IPI's Senior Advisor for External Relations, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Distinguished Author Series event featuring Nazila Fadi, author of The Lonely War, One Woman's Account of the Struggle for Modern Iran. Nazila has written a compelling book about her own experience of being a nine-year-old schoolgirl in Tehran when the Islamic Revolution ousted the Shah and installed Ayatollah Khomeini as the supreme leader. Then, adjusting to the radical changes in her life that the new regime wrought, and then becoming a translator and a journalist, and as such, the longest-running Iran-based correspondent for Western publications, principally the New York Times, until her forced departure in 2009. She fled Iran that year after she had been covering the tumultuous street protest over the contested election results that returned Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to power. And she later counted 16 government thugs lurking outside the house where she lived with her husband and two small sons. A friendly insider had told her that government snipers had pictures of her and orders to shoot if she emerged in public. Aside from being a dramatic read, her book is particularly valuable at this moment because it provides an intimate view from inside a revolution and a society that have undergone a great transformation since that day in 1979 when Nazila found that she had to start going to school 30 minutes early each morning to join in chants of death to America and death to Israel, and could no longer swim in her neighborhood pool because she was a girl. Along the way, the country has had seven presidents, none of them more intriguing to the West than the present one, Hassan Rouhani, who won election in 2013 on a promise of rapprochement with the outside world, release from punishing sanctions on the economy, and an end to the country's international isolation. Maybe more importantly, though, the country has had only two supreme leaders, the person who, as the title implies, really calls the shots in Iran. President Rouhani and the current leader, Ali Khamenei, function astride a struggle that defines Iran today, one between hardliners and reformers, with added intensity now because of the ongoing talks, they actually resume today in Geneva, between Iran and the so-called P5 plus one, the US, the UK, France, Russia, China, and Germany, over whether Iran will curb its nuclear program to meet Western demands that it limit in a verifiable manner its capacity for making an atomic weapon. The revolution has created a large new middle class, many of whose members are young, educated, and female, which is pushing for more personal freedom and that promised renewed relationship with the outside world. Nazila wonders in her book whether the regime, by lifting so many people out of poverty into the middle class, has inadvertently created a large segment of the population that has come to oppose many of the regime's most hardline policies. At the same time, her personal experience and her continued reporting on Iran, which she now pursues from outside the country, has taught her to be wary of overestimating the influence of the pragmatic leaders or disregarding the cunning and the power of the entrenched ideological leadership. Her story is one of seasoned analysis and also one of great personal courage. And we have copies of her book for sale at the door and I will make sure that we have ample time at the end of this program for Nazila to sign them and to chat with you. Though she and I were writers at the New York Times at the same time, we were in different places, and I only had the pleasure of meeting her this past Friday. I am delighted to be able to share that pleasure now with you, and to welcome to IPI, Nazila Fadi. Well, 
Warren, thank you very much for your kind uh, introduction. And thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to be here uh, in a room full of uh, people who are interested to learn about Iran. Uh, one of the lessons that I learned about Iran was in 2004, uh, a little before the presidential election that led to the election of uh, uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, I'd gone to see a reformist uh, editor uh, to ask him about what was going on among reformers, if they had a viable candidate for the elections. President Khatami had already served two terms, and he couldn't run again. So everybody was wondering if the reformers had a good candidate in mind so that uh, the reform would continue. I interviewed him. I got a sense that the reformers were not that prepared. They didn't have a good candidate in mind. Disappointedly, I closed my notebook, put it away, and I had learned to stay for another cup of tea, um, just to linger and uh, have another chat, more informal one. And then at that point, I don't know what this editor said, uh, but he casually referred to uh, the Shah and his father. And I, without paying attention, I just dismissed them as dictators. And then suddenly this editor snapped at me angrily and he said that I didn't know my history. And I was shocked. Uh, he said to me that the Shah and his father had set the foundation for modern Iran, that they, they had built the country, developed the country. Without them, Iran wouldn't be where it is right now. And uh, that he didn't expect young, younger people like me to talk like that. I was extremely shocked. Familiar with that conversation. I'd heard it many, many times from my parents. My parents had always been uh, pro Shah. They, they'd never supported the revolution. I'd heard the conversation from ordinary Iranians on the streets who had a nostalgic feeling about the old good days before the revolution. And when I had just started my uh, job as, as a stringer for the New York Times, one of my assignments was to go to bookstores and ask what kind of books people were buying. And it turned out that people were interested in buying books about the royal family. And not because they wanted uh, his son, the Shah's son, to come back to Iran or to have a monarchy in Iran, but because they felt something had, they had back then and they had lost. Um, then the editor said something that made total sense. Until then, I was wondering where this guy is coming from because he had been a member of the Revolutionary Guards in the beginning of the revolution. He had fought in the war. And he had been the head of a, a militia center called Comité in the beginning of the revolution. And these centers were very much responsible for rounding up people. And people who had been arrested by these forces, they had been executed, hundreds of people, uh, a lot of them during summary trials. Uh, whether uh, they were really political or they, or they were not, nobody know, knows. A lot of people close to the Shah had been executed, and along with them, anyone who had opposed the new regime. So this was this guy's background. But then he said something that made total sense to me. He said, we fought for political freedom. But after the revolution, we lost our personal freedoms too. And this was something that even I, as a nine-year-old girl, as Warren said, had felt it very well in 1979. I used to go to an American school. I used to dress in any way that I wanted. But then suddenly, after the revolution, I couldn't even swim in the swimming pool that we had in our apartment building. I had to wear a headscarf. I couldn't choose the color of the scarf that I wore. I couldn't choose the style of the coat that I had to wear. Nothing, everything was dictated by, by the regime. And these little things, um, uh, just things that come down to being able to swim in a pool or not, or being able to go out with, with the opposite sex, when you lose the freedom to have those kinds of options, they can become quite suffocating. Um, but th they're not enough uh, for people to lead them to make dramatic measures uh, to take control of their fate. There are many, many other things that they have shaped uh, the Iranian nation. Uh, one reason I wrote this book was to tell how many revolutionaries have evolved, and they have become people like this editor, 
who are quite disillusioned with with the regime that they founded themselves, that they, they made a lot of sacrifices for. This guy had fought in the war. A lot of uh, people who fought with him in the war uh, had died. Uh, but he was very disappointed in what had happened. And that's why he was a member of the reform camp. Um, but, but you know, Iranians, we, we've had it like 35 years has passed since the revolution. And when Westerners talk about Iran, uh, there are a lot of cliches uh, that I wanted to show in this book how these cliches are not true. Uh, in, in 1999, as you know, some of the worst anti-regime demonstrations broke out. Uh, it was after President Khatami had been elected president. A lot of uh, independent newspapers had flourished. But at the same time, the regime was cracking down, was shutting down newspapers, arresting journalists and activists, putting them in jail. And then new newspapers were emerging. Um, after the student protest in 99 was uh, repressed, people were jailed. About a year after that, I met with a student leader who had been jailed, tortured, and was not in a very good shape when I saw him a year after his release. Um, he uh, was still active. Uh, and he was still part of the student movement. I was meeting him with a colleague who had covered Iran for a long time and uh, thought she knew a lot about Iran and about revolutions. During our interview, my colleague asked the student leader, leader whether he was willing to die uh, for freedom, for democracy. Um, the student uh, leader was quite surprised. And he looked at her and said that He's been fighting for a better life. He has never thought about dying for more freedom. Um, when we walked out, my colleague told me that she was quite disappointed. And she didn't think that uh, the reformers and Iranian activists would be able to move anything forward because they were not people who were willing to make sacrifices. She told me that during the 1979 revolution, uh, there had been a lot of people who were willing to die. Uh, it, this had been true during the French Revolution, during the American Revolution, and there won't be any change if people are not willing to make any sacrifice. I thought a lot about what she said. And after that, I kept on wondering whether any of the activists that I met w were willing to die. And I asked them. And none of them told me that uh, they were, I mean, they had, uh, any uh, intention of becoming a martyr the way martyrdom has become a cliche in the West that um, a lot of uh, Shiite Muslims uh, don't mind dying for a cause. And you know, th there's a history to that. After the 1979 revolution, there was bloodshed. A lot of people were executed. A lot of Iranians know that when there is a revolution, there is institutional breakdown. There's insecurity. And it's the best time for extremists to hijack the situation. And this is what Khomeini did. Khomeini was not the only one who led the revolution. There were many, many other forces who fought against the Shah. There were the Marxists, the leftists, and they played a major role during the revolution. Actually, the majority of the educated people were Marxists and leftists, because that was the ideology of the avant-garde back then. And then we had a war. We had eight years of war with, with Iraq. And uh, you know, I, whenever I watch a movie about World War II, whenever I hear the siren, I remember the, the fear that I felt when I was growing up. We heard exactly the same siren from every corner. And we had to run, find shelter, go down the stairs to a basement or, or, or somewhere. These are memories that my generation has grown up with. They have shaped us. And we, we don't like any kind of insecurity like that. We want to distance ourselves from anything that is about violence, anything that is about dogma. The Islamic Republic tried to raise a generation that was uh, uh, loyal to its ideology. Every morning, we had to go to school and chant death to America and death to Israel. But you know, we, we just chanted. We didn't believe in it. We, we, wanted, we didn't want to 
keep hatred in our hearts. We just wanted to distance ourselves from dogma. And then, of course, as you know, the war ended after eight years. Some 250,000 people were killed on both sides. There was no uh, victory on either side. Uh, the south of Iran was destroyed. A lot of people were left disabled. So Iranians want to distance themselves from what happened during the first decade of the revolution. The majority of the population is either uh, my generation or younger people, people who were born after the war. They've heard the stories from their parents, or maybe they have lost their parents in the war or during the executions. Iranians are very well aware of uh, the insecurity that comes with the revolution. In 2009, when Iranians withdrew from the streets, a lot of my colleagues at the Times um, would tell me that Iranians failed, that they weren't able to uh, have a revolution. And so when they came out, it was all a failure. And to me, it wasn't. To me, it was a victory. I mean, three th million people had come out on the streets to send a message to the regime. And they had managed to send a very loud and clear message to the regime. And I knew that Iranians had not come out to have a revolution in 2009. Whatever happened was quite spontaneous. And to the last day, people were chanting slogans that they wanted new elections. They were carrying banners that called for uh, new elections. The violence that the regime used against people made them angry and uh, helped snowball the protests into much bigger than what they had initially been. But Iranians knew that there was no other alternative to the Islamic Republic. And if they had managed to overthrow the, the regime, there would have been insecurity, institutional breakdown, and something very similar to what happened in 1979, when in 2012 the Egyptian revolution occurred and uh, Egyptians were able to overthrow uh, Mubarak I thought Iranians would be envious because uh, the Egyptians had uh, managed to achieve something that Iranians had not been able to do in six months. But then it was very interesting, the social media networking, they had, there was where people were talking about it. And a lot of people were uh, posting comments that, OK, Egyptians had a revolution. They are where we were in 1979. And they were writing comments like, uh, building a democracy is hard. We wish them luck. They are in the beginning of the way. And it turns out that they were right, that democracy is not a package that comes into the country with, um, with a revolution and can be easily unpacked. Um, Iran has changed profoundly over the past 35 years. Uh, and that's why people's attitudes have changed uh, this way. Um, in addition to uh, the violence and the bloodshed of the first decade of the revolution, uh, the regime relied on the poorer people, people from uh, rural areas as its support base because more educated people had been the leftists and uh, the revolutionaries went after them. So they knew they couldn't uh, rely on the upper class and the middle class. And instead, they recruited people from the lower classes uh, especially at the civil sector. Um, and after the war broke out, even their women were employed by the government. When I went to school, there were these morality teachers who came to our schools. Uh, they were young women in full uh, chador, head to toe, covered in black. And uh, they were supposed to teach us about the revolution's ideology. Um, they told us how to pray. They taught us religious rituals and also uh, politics. I was supposed to listen to the Friday prayers every week and uh, have a summary of the prayers uh, for my teacher. Uh, they wanted to instill the kind of ideology that Khomeini desired uh, to, to raise uh, a generation of ideological uh, people. And it failed. Because first of all, we felt disconnected from these people. They banned us from things that they had no idea what they were. Uh, a lot of them had from the villages. And in the meantime, these women started going to university. Uh, they moved up in society because they had uh, a stable income. Uh, and they became part of the middle class. By 1990s, after Khomeini had died, a lot of these women had become religious feminists. 
And one of the most interesting magazines that emerged in the 1990s was a feminist magazine called Zana, uh, run by a woman who was very much a woman who had uh, moved up in society after the revolution. And uh, religious women and secular women uh, together wrote articles in this magazine uh, calling for more rights for women. And practically, by the 1990s, the gap between secular women and religious women had completely disappeared. And they were all asking for the same thing. Religious women, just like secular women, wanted equal rights uh, in the family and in society. And partly because after the revolutionaries had come to power, they had replaced the secular law before the revolution with the religious law that in many cases discriminated against women, considered the value of a woman's life, half of that a, of a man's life. Women did not have the right uh, to get divorced. Their husbands could divorce them any time he wished. He could marry up to four wives. And it, women felt like second-class citizens, including those who had been empowered by the regime. And uh, the revolution did keep its promise of distributing the oil wealth among the people. Uh, the middle class has uh, grown uh, after the revolution. According to figures in 2009, some 40 percent of the population were middle class, and that includes people in rural areas. That means people in rural areas are not that poor. 40 percent of the population is lower middle class, and that is about 80 percent of society. Uh, women uh, have been studying since the revolution. Uh, the, the revolutionaries have been encouraging them uh, to, to do whatever they want to. I mean, I was never told growing up in Iran that there was something I couldn't do because I was a woman. I could do anything as long as I was covered. I was discriminated because I was showing hair, because I was not wearing the right clothes, but I was never told there was something that I couldn't do. Since 2000, more than 60% of uh, university students have been women. Uh, that means there are more educated women in Iran than men right now. And fertility rate has dropped to almost less than uh, two per woman, 1.9%. Uh, 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 and all these numbers show that Iran is not a society, uh, that its, its people are willing to go out on the streets and get killed. I want to just conclude by saying that uh, uh, when I was in Iran in 2009, I had a hard time finding a cab driver who was willing to drive me downtown Tehran uh, to cover the protests because they were, they were afraid that their cars would get dented at the protests. So if people were not making, willing to uh, get their cars damaged, you can imagine how far they're willing to make sacrifices. This is a society that now doesn't care about the nuclear program. Whatever you hear in the West about Iran is about its nuclear program. Uh, and the, the assumption that perhaps the sanctions are going to drive uh, these people to have a revolution against uh, the regime, that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, first of all, the middle class is still middle class. Life has become harder, but everything is still available except for some kind of cancer medication, perhaps, or because things are a little bit more expensive. But what Iranians still care about is about daily freedoms, about the kind of personal space that the revolution has taken away from them. And a good example of that was what happened just a few week weeks ago in Iran after a young musician passed away of cancer. Uh, he was not well known. Uh, he was not that uh, popular, uh, but on the day of his burial, tens of thousands of people all over the country poured out on the street uh, singing his love songs. Now, this is a big crime because, first of all, Iranians are not supposed to pour out uh, on the streets in such numbers. Singing, singing love songs, even worse. And then women were also singing, and women are not allowed to sing. So whatever they were doing was not uh, political, but it was political by nature because it was challenging the regime's um, uh, rules. Um, so Iranians, having engaged in this funny kind of uh, conversation with the regime, every time they have an opportunity, 
uh, they pour out on the streets. Uh, they send messages as signals uh, to the government. Um, and this is a regime that we know doesn't respond to those messages. We just learned that they, it hears them. And every once in a while, it does respond. And I think the 2013 election of uh, President Rouhani uh, was a response to that. It had hurt people. It had realized that uh, it needs some kind of support base in the country. It knows that it's not popular, but it knows that uh, to survive, uh, both international pressure and uh, on popularity at home, every once in a while, it has to respond to what people want. Um, can I talk about the nuclear program? Please, please. So Don't I, stop. I, I can't. Everyone saw it and listening. <laughs> so I, it, because the issue is so relevant now, uh, I was so disappointed that uh, the talks failed last week. And I thought there was every sign that su suggested this time there will be an agreement. Then I remembered um, Ayatollah Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, uh, just a few weeks uh, before the talks had officially resumed. He was released from the hospital. Uh, he came out of the hospital, and uh, uh, the, he was supposed to talk about his health. Instead, he said that when he had been in the hospital, uh, he had been watching TV, and he had been following the news. And practically, he said that uh, he was very disappointed that Iran had been uh, uh, excluded from uh, the, the talks in Paris that were supposed to build coalition against ISIS. He said that Iran had been informally invited, uh, uh, but then the invitation had been withdrawn. And it reminded me that this man wants to leave a legacy behind. This man is not going to uh, give up Iran's uh, right to the nuclear program, as he calls it, uh, easily. Every time the talks have failed, and every time Iranians have gone back to uh, the negotiation table, they've got a better deal. Every time they've gone bad over, back over the past 10 years, they've got a better deal. They have survived the sanctions. They can survive it. So there is no reason for them to, to back down now. And um, Ayatollah Khamenei wants to leave a legacy behind. He wants to leave this legacy behind that Iran did not bow to international pressure under his leadership. He sees himself as the leader who wants to take Iran to the same glory, I think, that the Shah wanted to, to take. This is not about religion. This is about politics and about ro the role of Iran in the region. He not only wants to be remembered as the man who did not bow to international pressure, he wants to be remembered as the leader who managed to make Iran a superpower in the region, and all the other countries acknowledged that. In his talk, he has constantly referred to, to the idea that Iran will not give in to international power if it's not treated as an equal power, that its influence in the region should be recognized. And now Iran is doing what it can in Iraq uh, to at least keep ISIS away from Iranian borders. I, I'm not sure how much they care about ISIS, but ISIS is a threat for Iran as much as it is for any other country in the region because we share a long border with Iraq. So um, I hope that's something that um, Westerners in their negotiations with Iranians would uh, remember that uh, Ayatollah Khamenei doesn't want to be treated as this, as this, as the leader of a pariah state that has to give in he is not going to do that. His country has survived. The revolution has survived for 35 years. And Iranians don't care about the nuclear program. What's on their mind is something that is totally different. So he is not under pressure at home because of the sanctions. Thank you. I told Nazila before that do you hear me okay? That my, uh, my habit here is to read the book extremely closely to a number of issues that I hope the speaker brings up. And usually, 
a speaker that I have here will fail to bring up one of the others. I've been checking off as Nazila's been speaking. <laughs> She's mentioned every single thing, including the pop singer who died. I thought that oh. was my <laughs> ace in the hole. Uh, I have his name here. He died at 30 years old, Morteza Pashai. Yeah. And I was going to ask Nazila what that meant, the outpouring, and she's already told you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and I also uh, was going to ask and will ask about um, the ongoing negotiations. What's happened? They really did resume today in Geneva, and they will move to a higher plane by the end of the week. Uh, the expectation among, the, you know, even though June 30th is the ultimate date, there seems to be real hope on both sides that, that something will be reached, at least a framework will be reached, really in just the weeks or months to come. But there has been that expectation for quite a while. I was surprised, not surprised, but I was happy to hear you say that this time you were particularly disappointed because <laughs> you told me once, or actually I heard you speak once before, and you said that most Iranians were thinking that the deal would happen because it, it sort of made sense and it was the way, and given all the circumstances you talked about, the election of Rouhani, um, the, con and the fact that Iran is able to get from the West each time it goes back, yeah. more and more concessions. And I wanted to ask you now, I mean really like today as they resume, do you think it is possible for the Supreme Leader to finally say we have demonstrated that we are respected, uh, that we have equivalency with the countries we're talking to, um, that our right to enrich is, is secure, and we will go the next couple of steps to make this deal. Do you think it could happen this time? I, I, you know, I or was... Do you think he will never make the deal? Um, I personally think he's not going to make any deals. Uh, but I've made predictions, and they've, I've been wrong, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. Uh, yes, you're right. Before uh, November 24th, everybody I spoke to, they were not even thinking that there won't be a deal. I mean, everybody was so positive in the, in the country. And it's so funny that they still are. A lot of people think there will be a deal. But they, they weren't even able to reach uh, the political framework. That was a huge setback. I mean, the deal is one thing, the political agreement is a different thing, and they, they had not been able to go that far uh, in a year of talks. So I don't know how they would be able to do it now in a much shorter period of time. And the general interpretation is that, the, that President Rouhani and the foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who some of us here knew well when he was the ambassador uh, to the UN, that they were pushing it as hard as they could, and that at the very end, they were getting instructions from home, which means the Supreme Leader, that's as far as you can go. Is that a fair interpretation? Uh, I think that's, the, that's, that's a fair interpretation, and this had happened before as well. I mean, uh, Larry Johnny, the a former a nuclear negotiator, he was able to reach a deal too. But then he was told that uh, he has to back down. And then he went back to Iran and resigned. The Supreme Leader, his power is total, and I think that's unchallenged right now. Um, he's uh, 79 years old, yes? Uh, might be, uh, in, in no, his 70s. That's what yeah, he says he is. Yeah, okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Which to some of us in this room is not too old. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and I think the longevity mm -hmm. of these Iranian leaders is, is quite broad. Yeah. Um, do you think... What will happen after him? Let's assume that at some point he's no longer in power, no longer alive. Do you think there'll be a third supreme leader, or do you think Iranians will have, will retire the supreme leader model and find something else? Well, there's going to be an election in 2016 that will decide uh, the the members of uh, assembly of experts, the council that decides uh, uh, who who should replace him. Uh, but I think everyone, even the conservatives, have realized that it's been a mistake to invest so much power in one single person. If there is going to be another supreme leader, and this is something that the Constitution allows, I think it's going to be a, a, a council of leaders, two or three uh, supreme leaders that will decide together. I have one more thing to ask you, and I've slipped my mind. If we can go to the audience here in a second. Um, the, um, 
Well, I'll remember it later. That's okay. good. I would love to get your hands in. What I'm going to do is uh, ask you um, to speak. Maybe I'll take three questions at once, and Nazila, you can just listen to them okay. and I'm comment after and make notes. And, and I'm, when I call on you, I'm going to ask you to please stand, wait for the microphone, speak to the microphone, hold it very close to your mouth, because we are webcasting this, and that's the way uh, you'll be able to get the sound. So if I could, this gentleman first, and my second and third there. Okay, one, two, three, and then we'll take three more. Yeah, hi there. Um, I finished your- Introduce yourself. My name is Brian O'Reilly. Um, I finished your book yesterday. I thought it was terrific. I, I, I hope everyone here in the audience and anyone listening buys it. Um, the, uh, my question to you, right, right at the very end of the book, you make a comment about the importance that the high price of oil had to the regime in terms of being able to do things for uh, the poorer classes and ultimately being able to create uh, a middle class, although that may have backfired on them. My question is, we're talking about sanctions and whether they stay or not, but is really the critical issue, what is the price of oil? If we're, going, if we're heading into a period of $50 oil or below, that has enormous implications for the budget of the Iranian and the Venezuelan and the Russian economies. Who wins in that scenario? Is that, does that favor the hardliners or does that favor the reformers? Okay. Hello and thank you. I'm sorry, I was, okay, you go second, oh. you'll be. My name is Mel Duncan from Nonviolent Peace Force. And my question regards Iran's role in Syria. And noting the support of the Assad government and the support of Hezbollah, do you see any realistic role uh, that Iran could play in a transition that would preserve Syria? And then Malik the third. Thank you. Uh, my name is Manik Mehta. I'm a journalist. Uh, my question to you is about the ISIS. Since both US and Iran regard the ISIS as a common enemy, do you see any rapprochement or some kind of an understanding between the two? I also wanted to ask you about Syria, but he preempted. Yeah. <laughs> if you can take those three questions, that'd sure. be great. Uh, so the first question on oil, I, I think that is such an um, interesting question. You know, the reform movement uh, flourished in the late 1990s uh, when uh, the price of oil was less than $10 a barrel. So I think if uh, oil prices uh, drop, it's good news from de for democracy. And in 2009, uh, when um, the regime was um, so adamantly uh, cracking down on protesters, it was at a time that um, oil revenue had peaked. Uh, it had never been so high. Uh, the, 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 the amount of uh, petrol dollar that was pouring into the country it had never been so high in the history uh, since oil had been discovered in Iran, which, which suggested that the, the regime had enough money to splurge on its supporters, uh, or even those who were not its supporters, to go out on the streets and uh, beat up angry protesters. Uh, I think it's good news. Uh, whenever oil prices uh, drop, uh, it gives uh, the ability to people to recruit, come together. And in the meantime, they become less dependent on the government's generosity. They become more entrepreneurial, they produce uh, things. Uh, one of the, uh, I think, negatives of Iranian society has been its, its failure to contribute to the production of national wealth. Uh, Iranians of uh, mo all, all classes, Iranians are mostly uh, engaged in service uh, sectors. Uh, uh, even Iran's agriculture has gone downhill. So I think that would be good news. Uh, and interestingly, uh, even uh, Ayatollah Khamenei has said that. He said that Iran should not depend on oil. Um, on Iran's role in Syria, you know, Iranian, uh, the Iranian regime is divided um, between two camps. The extremists who, are, who don't act rationally and pragmatists who have acted very rationally. And whatever they have done, 
has been to uh, help the survival of the regime. The extremists, however, they resort to measures uh, that creates crisis, uh, and then that crisis has helped them to survive. They, they, I mean, these people are the ones who have been in charge, mostly since the begin beginning of the revolution, and whatever they have done is about the long-term survival of the regime, not the, about the short-term survival of the regime, not about the long-term survival of the regime. I, I think Iran's role in Syria, uh, its support for Hezbollah, and, and even um, what led to uh, creation of ISIS. I think there have been many, many factors that have led to the creation of uh, ISIS, not only the role of Iran or Iraq or the United States. There have been many, many different factors. But uh, whatever Iranians have done, it has been toward the, creating crises that helps them uh, survive. I mean, look at the hostage taking in the beginning of the revolution. Some students went, attacked the US embassy. They had no plan to stay in the embassy. But then Khomeini came out and supported it. And uh, the student leaders who had been the hostage takers became hostages in the embassy themselves. That's what they have all said. Uh, and 444 days of uh, hostage crisis uh, helped the regime to to survive and promote this ideology, the anti-US uh, ideology. The war was another crisis that helped uh, Khomeini to stabilize the foundations of the regime. Without it, the Islamic regime, I don't think, would have survived. And all the other crises that have been created since then, they're just strategies to help the regime go on for a few more years. Um, if the pragmatists are the dominant voice in Iran, uh, they were from 97 uh, to th 2005 when President Khatami uh, was in charge. You, you didn't hear these, uh, about these kinds of uh, supports. Uh, Iran's role had been uh, contained. Uh, the extremists had been to some extent contained. However, there were people in Iraq, members of the Revolutionary Guards, who were still uh, acting independently. So I, I think what comes out of, uh, uh, should come out of uh, the talks, and that's what I'm looking forward, is a deal, uh, eventually. Because the deal is going to help the pragmatists to cha take charge of Iran's diplomacy. And when moderates are in power, uh, they will gradually become the uh, dominant voice. Extremists would get isolated. And it would make Iranians more accountable for what they're doing. Either it's in Syria, or it's in Iraq, or even what, what, what they're doing to their own people inside the country. Uh, I am totally in favor of a talk, uh, in favor of a deal, because I think it will give the upper hand to Iranian moderates, uh, to pragmatists who are willing to, to be accountable for their actions. Which might be the very reason why the Revolutionary Guard is against the deal. Exactly. And, and also, you can argue, and I think you sort of made this point, that, that one of the uh, uh, cynical things about the sanctions is the sanctions, in a funny way, empower the extremists because they're the ones who are making a killing, know how to get around the sanctions, and quite happy to be able to blame the whole thing on the West. Exactly. I, I think you took care of the question two and three in one answer. Yeah. Very good. Um, uh, I had one, I never remember the question I wanted to ask you, then we'll get three more. And it was this, you have been talking now about 20, 30 minutes, and you've not said the word Sunni and the word Shia. Um, the interpretation from outside of what's happening in the Middle East on a grand plan is, is Sunni versus Shia, and quite specifically Iran versus Saudi Arabia for dominance um, in the region. How is that seen from within Iran? Um, I, I think Iranians feel that competition very much as well, because Iranians feel that, uh, first of all, they're Persian. And uh, they have Persianized Islam by creating the Shiite faith, their own, uh, their own faith. Um, and the title of the book, The Lonely War, comes from this idea how Iranians are so lonely uh, <laughs> where they are. Uh, Iran is surrounded uh, by almost hostile countries. I mean, we had a war with uh, Iraq. We went into a war with Taliban almost in 99. Iranian troops had gone to the border after Taliban um, uh, attacked Iran's consulate uh, in Mazar Sharif and killed some 11 uh, diplomats there. So we were in, on the verge of a war with, uh, with Afghanistan. 
Pakistan has its nuclear weapon, is not a very friendly country. And then there are all these Sunni Arab countries that are clearly not Iran's friends during the war. Most of them uh, supported Saddam. Um, th th that rivalry is uh, playing itself in Iraq. Uh, and also ISIS. I mean, uh, I, Ayatollah Khamenei was very angry during his talk, very clearly, because he even said it, that uh, Sunni countries had lobbied and persuaded the United States to exclude Iran from the talks. And Iran doesn't want to be the country that is easily sidelined uh, by, uh, by Sunni countries that are constantly taking position against Iran. And uh, that is something that is going to go on. Uh, and when you think about it, Iran and Israel are the only two natural allies in the region. <laughs> uh, you might have to Ann Phillips in the front row. This gentleman here, and then Jeff Barretti. And we'll get to the other one. Once again, we'll do three at once. And okay. Well, first of all, I want to thank you. That was absolutely fascinating. Thank you for sharing this. And I will read your book. I look forward to it very much. Um, I, uh, there was a time when we were read constantly in the, in the newspapers and in foreign, the foreign policy periodicals and so forth, how disliked we were in most Muslim countries. But the one country... Just a little... Oh, yeah, uh, can good. you hear me yeah, now? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Should I repeat what I said? With no, the no, it's okay. No, okay. The one country where we were popular among the population and the people was in Iran, which seemed to be such a paradox because we had little contact with you and there was so much anti-American rhetoric. I mean, the, the Satans and death to America and the hostage situation and so forth. I wonder whether that changed, first of all, whether that was true. And secondly, after 9-11, when so many American policies changed in the world and not, in my judgment, not for the better in terms of uh, how, how are standing in the world. So the question was whether uh, Iranians are anti-US still? or Whether they still think, uh, mm -hmm. whether we are still popular there with the population. Mm -hmm. And whether at the time of the elections, when the people were out in the streets calling for help from the United States and we didn't respond, did that have a very serious negative impact on the Iranians and their attitude towards America? Okay, thank you. So, um, I can, in a way, yourself, please? yes, I'm, my name is Arthur Ali, and I just came back from Iran. I was there two weeks ago. I came back four weeks. And I can answer, ask a question at the same time, answer a question. It was wonderful to be there. I was there for two weeks, as, just as a tourist with my wife. And I can tell you that the Iranian people were very, very happy to see Americans and very happy with America. But they're not happy with our government. And in a way, the irony, it comes along the following way. They say that it's in the interest of the United States to have an ayatollah and to have saber rattling going on in Iran. So I'd say, well, what is the reason we would want that? You would think that would not be in our interest. And their answer is, as a result of what the ayatollah does, it permits the United States to have bases in Qatar, in Oman, in Saudi Arabia, and to basically, in those countries which have lots of land, but not the kind of population that you have in Iran, we are, then, in effect, their backbone and we stand uh, at to gain. And our influence in the Middle East, particularly with the oil producing countries, is served by having a reactionary Ayatollah. And the more stuff that the Ayatollah does that bothers us, the better in a way it is for our military and so on and so forth. So when you try to get your hands around the, what's going on, and basically everything there is double entendre. You know, it is not a straight, direct line. So I'd like to hear how you feel about that. They love the people. They think that our government has let them down time and time again, and that the reason that the Americans are not going to come to the aid of the Iranians is because our interest is really with the Sunni countries that have the oil in the Middle East. Thank you. Um, Jeff Laurenti. <coughs> Jeff Laurenti. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, in your, your last sentence in response to Warren's last question, was quite provocative in a way, that, quote, Israel and Iran are natural allies. Under the Shah's regime, in fact, they were tacit allies, along with the Turks, uh, the non-Arab states in the region, uh, having at least quiet 
or in the Turkish case, more overt connections. Uh, but that obviously changed with the revolution. I guess the question is, and the Israelis for a number of years thought that this is just rhetoric, and they were the ones who encouraged Reagan to make the arms for uh, hostages deals uh, uh, that came back to bite uh, Reagan so badly. Is this hostility that we hear continually from the Iranian, as you call it, regime, uh, voices just built into the DNA of the Islamic Republic? Uh, or and, and setting aside Netanyahu and, and the obstacles to peace and all that, can you foresee, without a, a large upheaval, uh, Iranians pragmatically agreeing, at least if there's a peace deal between Israelis and Palestinians, to reestablishing a rapprochement, being able to deal with a, a, a country that is Jewish, uh, there in, in the Middle East. Uh, how deeply ingrained is this hostility that they have that now has Netanyahu thinking that they're the biggest existential threat? Mm. Um, I, I think America and Americans uh, are very popular in Iran, definitely. Um, uh, I I glad that you did mention your the reaction that people had to you because uh, a lot of people go to Iran for the first time and uh, yeah their relatives are their parents their children are worried uh, they go they come back and they have all these wonderful stories how people invited them to their homes to have tea to have food with them uh, people Iranians they love Americans uh, more than any other nationality you would be surprised uh, it hasn't always been like that. I think what happened in 1970, uh, 1980, the hostage taking and everything, um, it was because Iranians were mad at the Americans uh, because of the 1953 coup. Uh, people remembered that. I mean, uh, they don't like foreign powers to interfere in the affairs of their country. And the whole idea of conspiracy theory that, oh, so Americans have brought the ayatollahs in Iran so that they can have bases in Qatar and in other countries. It all com comes from that uh, historical background, that there were incidents that foreigners interfered in Iran politics. They staged a coup. Uh, not just that, in 1921, they brought the Shah's father, Reza Shah, to power. So there have been many examples of uh, foreign intervention. Uh, but I think they were so embarrassed by the hostage taking uh, and uh, it had had such bad consequences for Iranians uh, that now it had, uh, it has, it had had a reverse uh, effect. And people are very pro-American despite the anti-US uh, sentiment in other parts of the Middle East. Uh, however, I think that is changing a little bit. I am hearing from many ordinary people who are suffering under the sanctions, that they're saying, oh, Americans are hurting us. They're not hurting the regime. The sanctions are, are driving the prices up for us. Not uh, the, the, the regime is selling its oil. It's finding a way uh, to sell the oil, and it has access to, uh, to money. Uh, so that might change if the sanctions keep on uh, dragging. Um, but, but I think the, the story that they tell you is part of that conspiracy. Iran and many parts of the Middle East. Did they did did the Iranians the Americans to support them? Um, no, I don't think Iranians wanted uh, any kind of direct intervention in 2009. But they did want wanted uh, their their uprising to be recognized. They wanted the world to hear uh, the message. The message was that this regime is not popular that this regime has stolen this election, that this president is, an, is a total embarrassment for us. We don't want him to represent us. Uh, this was which they wanted the world to hear that. But I think they want to be the narrator of their own stories. That's why they were so active. Uh, I mean, the citizen journalism that uh, came out of Iran in uh, 2009 was amazing. I continued working for an entire year based on what people were sending me, uh, people were calling me, and the information that they were giving me. Uh, and I don't know what kind of support uh, the United States could have offered uh, the Iranians back then. Um, 
uh, going back to Israel-Iran uh, relations, uh, I think the Islamic revolution was built on three pillars. And if one of them uh, collapses, it, it wouldn't be able to stand on to the other two pillars. One of them was hostility toward the United States. The other one, hostility toward Israel. And the third one on how women uh, present the Islamic Republic. Uh, and that is uh, about what they wear to the laws pertaining to women's rights. If either of these uh, uh, pillars collapse, the other two will collapse. And without these pillars, there would be nothing left of the Islamic Republic. Uh, so I think all three of them can collapse. But when, uh, that's the question. Nazila, do Iranians, are they afraid that the United States and or Israel will strike them militarily? Do they believe that's a possibility? There, there have been quite serious uh, concerns. Um, hmm. uh, and Iranians are very much afraid of that, yeah. ordinary Iranians. Uh, because, you know, without the war, a lot of people think that without the war with Iraq, Khomeini wouldn't have been able to, to keep the revolution going to hijack it from other political groups. There were many other uh, political factions who had huge support base in the country. Um, Khomeini's supporters w were mostly from the lower class, and he called them Mustazafin, the deprived. But with the war, he managed to galvanize the entire country behind an outside enemy. Everybody went to, to, to fight against an outside, against Iraq. They wanted to push back. and. Uh, fights uh, against an enemy. If, if there is an attack, the same thing would happen. Uh, everybody would unite behind the regime to, uh, to fight. Um, mm. There's one, there's two, and here's three, okay? One, three. Good evening. My name is Rush Roshan, and I am Persian. Yeah, hold it very close. First of all, I would like to thank you for writing the book and being the best antidote <laughs> for all the uh, advertising which has been going for years against our country. Uh, I want to hear your opinion about the fact that Iran is a signatory to NPT and many countries around Iran some with public knowledge and some without, have the nuclear power. Iran is a country with nearly 80 million population, and the need for nuclear energy is great. Why the international community does not recognize and does not treat Iran like any other country? Thank you. Uh, where was my second? Hi, Nazila. Hi, Hi. Uh, Hi, My question is about the talks. Can you introduce yourself, please? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> my name is Sunil Narula, and uh, I work at the UN. And I've spent actually seven years in Iran, and Nazila is an old friend from there. I was with the UN in Iran. Uh, my question is that when we talk about the talks and the possibility whether they'll succeed or not, we often talk in terms of Iranian leaders not agreeing to the talks. And we often forget what's happening in Washington. And now with the Republicans winning the, Cong the Congress, how much do you think that really matters to the whole mix of whether the deal will ever be reached? Though we do blame the Iranian leaders for that, and I'm not sure if they are the only ones to blame. So what is your opinion on that? And the third. <coughs> <Here>. <laughs> Hi, I'm Richard Morris. You talked about the convergence of the, the secular and the religious women towards feminism. And I'm curious about uh, the changing views or of the males in the population. Three good questions. Uh, let me talk with the, the one that is not about the nuclear program, and then I'll talk. Yeah. Uh, you know, Iranian society has uh, changed. Uh, uh, it's not just uh, the women who have changed. Uh, a lot of uh, these men are, who are going to university, especially now, are the children of those mothers, uh, mothers who have been empowered, 
mother, mothers who have, discrimi have felt the discriminations of, of the laws. And even, I mean, Iranian culture is, is quite a male-dominated culture. I mean, it's not just the Islamic Republic that we have to blame for how women are treated. Uh, they, the, the, the Iranian women have been fighting against uh, quite a chauvinistic culture and the Islamic Republic's laws. Um, so young men, you, you hear them during protests. They're, they're also chanting uh, for more rights for women. Um, how much have they changed? It's a little bit hard to tell because divorce rates are very, very high. And perhaps that's a sign that uh, the younger men and younger women still are having different values in lives. Uh, according to numbers, uh, three out of every five marriage leads to divorce. Uh, but you know, the, the Iranian women are raising the next generation. They're raising uh, the, the future boys of this country. So they are going to change as well. Um, going back to NPT and the talks, uh, you know what? I, I think you're right. Iran is a signatory to NPT. Uh, there have been some violations. Um, Iran has said that it doesn't want to make a weapon. And it hasn't, there hasn't been any ev evidence that it has gone as far as making a weapon. Um, but you know, there are a lot of evidence that Iran doesn't need the nuclear program. And a lot of countries that have the nuclear uh, pa power plants, they are uh, looking to other options. Iran can also use solar energy. Iran can also use uh, wind energy. When you look at how much uh, the nuclear program has cost Iran so far, it's, it just doesn't make sense that a country would invest so much money uh, in, in a program that, I mean, now they're, they, they're getting 20,000 megawatts of power from the two power plants in Boucher. I mean, two plus two doesn't make sense here. Uh, so I, I, I think anyone would uh, suspect that Iran is up to uh, something else. Uh, does it want the bomb itself or doesn't want the capability? I think Iran wants the capability, and why not? I mean, it's, it's going to be a deterrent to keep the enemies away. When I was in Tehran, I, when, wherever I went in the country, I asked people. Uh, and like this was really in remote areas or just on, on the street from shopkeepers. And I asked them, what do you think about Iran's a nuclear program? And I made sure to say, what do you think about the program? And the first answer, the first thing that came to their head, everybody would tell me, if we had nuclear weapons, Saddam wouldn't have attacked Iran. So even people who are opposed to the regime, who don't support uh, any of the regime's policies, somehow they do want Iran to have some kind of weapon that would keep, keep uh, the enemies away. Um, if, if you ask the question in a different way, if you ask them, do you know how much money the, the regime has invested into this uh, nuclear program? And did you wish, for instance, to get two free meals a week uh, or have a nuclear program, the answer changes. So they don't know exactly how much it has cost the country and w what, what the outcome is. Um, so yeah, there is popular support for the program, uh, but it doesn't make sense. So I, I think uh, the pressure on Iran comes from uh, this idea that why is this country is going after a nuclear program while it can produce much more power from solar energy, from wind energy. Um, what was the last question? Oh, uh, Sunil, um, I think you're right. I think as much as the Iranian extremists uh, don't want a deal, there is pressure on uh, President Obama uh, not to proceed with a deal with Iran. I mean, what else can he do? He has already uh, written four letters to Iran's supreme leader, no one else, no other president had gone that far. Uh, Zarif and Kerry text each other directly. I mean, I, this is a huge uh, progress. Uh, there are, there's no one between them, no other European country. Nobody can blame France or any other European country for not delivering the messages or uh, stopping uh, Iran and US uh, from having a deal. There's really no obstacle, but there is huge pressure uh, here in the United States by the Republicans. And there is going to be more uh, the next seven months. That's why I'm more skeptical, because the longer it takes for them to reach a deal, uh, the more extremists, uh, both here and in Iran, 
can sabotage the possibility of a deal. So I, I think uh, you're right. I saw, uh, in, I saw a woman raise her hand in the back, but I don't see her anymore. And I was at the very end. Okay, I'll start with that gentleman in the back. And then um, do I, I saw some other hands. Okay, Iris, and then here in the front. Hi, uh, my name is Alex Hoyos. I'm an NYU grad student at the Global Affairs. Uh, I have a question for you in regards to the Holocaust. Uh, it's been an ongoing debate in the last couple of years, and uh, I saw a presentation by an Iranian leader back in uh, Nebraska, at the University of Nebraska. And uh, what are your thoughts on the fact that back in March 2014, the Ayatollah Twitter saying that the Holocaust is still an uncertain event? And it's still been going a lot of uh, debates that I've seen at the fact that they, that Iran still declines to accept that the Holocaust ever happened. So I would like you know your thoughts on that. Excellent, thank you. Where was my second? Uh, you, Iris. Hi, thanks again for doing this. This is great, Lauren. Um, Iris, introduce yourself, please. I'm Iris Beer. I'm with the Iran Project, and uh, I actually wanted to just build on that last question and answer that you just had. And Sunil's good question. I spent a lot of time actually with the U.S. Congress, and I would like to think if we do have an agreement, I'm really encouraged that you think that we should have an agreement, and I hope there's a lot of people in Iran that would agree with you there, and I think there's a lot of people in the United States, but we have to think about different scenarios, and even in the case that we do reach a comprehensive agreement on Iran's nuclear program, um, you know, we have to anticipate how the U.S. Congress might respond, different forms of legislation. So I'm more familiar on our end of what could ha could happen to append the process um, of the implementation process. What what would happen in Iran? What are the different scenarios? Um, you know, how would the hardliners react at that point? There's a lot of us that are concerned about the human rights situation in Iran. How would it affect these different uh, groups in Iran, and what would be the overall response? Do you think? Thanks. And then here in the front row. Peter Russell's my name. Peter Russell's my name. Uh, you've painted a, uh, a picture of an indefinite period before there could be a change. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the state of journalism in Iran now and how you see it going from here? You spoke briefly about the civic journalism a couple of years ago, but uh, how, how are people exchanging information and getting critical opinions? Right. That, that's a question I wanted to ask, Peter. Thank you for doing that. And make it a social media oh, okay. question because that's yeah. pretty important. Yeah. Uh, Holocaust. Holocaust. You know, uh, Khomeini had said the same thing too. I mean, it wasn't Ahmadinejad who said Israel should be wiped off the map. The first person who said it was Khomeini. And this was written on walls in, in Iran, in Farsi, in Persian, and also in English. And whenever there was a military parade, uh, they had written Israel should be wiped off the map on the missiles that they displayed. So uh, it wasn't a new, new thing. It, it's, it's part of the same ideology uh, of uh, promoting anti-Israel sentiments in the country. Uh, but it's so funny that they do not the Holocaust. When I was growing up in Iran, you know, uh, the clerics banned movies. Uh, and they, they would only screen certain movies, and they would broadcast them on state media. And it seemed like the, during the war, the only movies that they loved broadcasting were movies about the Second World War to sort of encourage this sense of resistance and uh, uh, enduring a war. And most of them, what about the Jews? Jews being repressed, the, the Holocaust, the camps and everything. So I grew up watching those movies, including a lot of other people, on state media. So as they uh, deny the Holocaust, uh, it, it, there is a generation of Iranians who has grown up watching these movies about Holocaust. Um, I think they like the attention that they get by making comments like that. Ahmadinejad clearly was entertained by, by them. Um, I, I am sure that uh, the Supreme Leader has made that comment. Uh, but when Ahmadinejad was making those comments, he refrained from making similar comments. But it, it's been part of the conversation. It's been part of the discourse. Khomeini started it, and it's going to take a very long time to change that discourse. Um, um, you know, I want to answer the third question before going oh. to the uh, Iraq reaction in Iran. And, and you know what? Uh, you mentioned that I painted a picture uh, that things are not going to change. But things have changed. Yeah, things have changed uh, dramatically in the past 35 years. Uh, you know, in... Uh, the first decade of the revolution, nobody uh, could 
uh, you, you, you never heard of any kind of anti-regime protests. But now they are happening all the time. During the, uh, the 2000, when I was in Iran, there were protests all the time. So P the public has learned to come out, uh, seize opportunities, uh, it, not only just to vent uh, their frustration, but also send messages to a regime that they were not able to communicate with. Um, and the state of media, I think Iranian media is much more dynamic and interesting than the media here. Uh, <laughs> I still enjoy reading uh, Persian language uh, newspapers on the web. Uh, they discuss things that um, are, are interesting. They are not afraid. Uh, there is freedom of press. There is no freedom after they uh, express themselves. <laughs> So, I mean, people land in prison, but they discuss almost anything, you know. But, but on, Twitter was banned at one point, was it not? Twitter is still banned. It's still banned, okay. But banned for ordinary Iranians. The okay. Supreme Leader himself, he tweets a lot. We know and that. yeah, uh, I follow him on Twitter, and I think it's the best way to uh, see what kind of mindset he has, like during the talk. He tweets in Farsi. Both Farsi and English. Yeah, he wants everybody to hear him. Sure. Yeah, uh, social media, amazing. A um, lot of government officials have their own blogs. They tweet. They have Facebook pages. Uh, I mean, Zarif's uh, Facebook page is very popular. Uh, he sends out messages to people constantly. He, he updates them on nuclear talks. He says, for example, I returned from uh, six hours of talks right now. My backache is killing me. It, it's quite casual. I mean, it has enabled people to um, communicate uh, with their leaders, including the foreign minister, without uh, the state media, which is amazing. And this is all change, I mean, uh, profound change. Um, so, um, yeah, uh, there are still amazing uh, journalists and very interesting uh, uh, newspapers inside the country. The government shuts them down, and then the, a new newspaper uh, appears with the same staff under a new name. So. Uh, that, that has been a game. Um, Iran's reaction if there is a nuclear deal, I think if there is a deal, it would happen uh, only if the supreme leader is on board, uh, which means he will uh, make sure that all the forces that are under his control, and that includes the Revolutionary Guards, uh, the militia Basij force, and the parliament, he will make sure that they would not oppose a deal. You might hear some noises here and there, and there were some going on just in the recent weeks. Some extremist members of parliament had conferences denouncing a deal or uh, warning uh, the president that he should not uh, seek rappro rapprochement with the United States. Uh, but you know, they didn't go that far. It's just like some noises. I think the opposition here is much more serious than any kind of uh, opposition inside the country. In Iran, the noise would be just on the sidelines uh, uh, so that uh, like the Iranian regime can pretend that it went ahead with a deal, even though there were some opposition at home. Uh, but I don't think a deal would help uh, uh, civil society directly, indirectly, and in the long run, it will, because it will be good for the country to be back in the international community. But I think if there is a deal, the extremists will make sure that they crack down on uh, uh, activism inside the country, free press, because they want to show that they're still in power and they're not, they're, they have their grip on the leash. Uh, and control has been a very important uh, uh, instrument uh, since the revolution. And, the idea has been to control the society, to tell how people should behave. So if, if there is a deal, they're going to tighten that leash. And suppose there is not a deal. I mean, suppose definitively it's decided there's no deal this time. What would the reaction to Iran be to that? Uh, there has been no reaction. I mean, it's funny because the, the day uh, uh, the nuclear talks failed uh, in November, there was absolutely no uh, public reaction. And just a week before that, people had come out on the streets uh, for the pop singer, for the musician. So if, they, if people are looking for an opportunity to... Uh, come out and uh, make a statement, they will find the opportunity. But to the nuclear deal, there was no reaction. We've got time for a few more questions. Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, if 
would be I'm just oh, gonna, Hope I'm Winthrop. Get two, just hang on one second. Uh, well, Anne, there's another one, so we'll give Anne Phillips a second chance, and Marie over. Okay, actually, why don't we do you first, Marie second, and then Anne five. I would think that there would and be could pressure. Could you please introduce yourself? Hope Winthrop. I would think there would be pressure from the people um, as the population is so young and so educated and suffering somewhat under the sanctions, they really would benefit tremendously from trade and investment from the outside. And I think also American businesses are going to be very anxious to get involved in doing business with Iran, and that might help with our Congress. So I'm just a little bit optimistic that there is some pressure and that the great leader could say, the supreme leader could say he is leading Iran into the future because he's going to be benefiting the people economically. I think if you left it to businessmen in the two countries, there'd be a deal tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Marie? Hi there, Marie O'Reilly from IPI. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, I just want to bring it back to your third pillar, if you don't mind, one more time. I, I'm fascinated that, that this third pillar makes it as one of the three, and I'd love if you could just articulate that a little further. Why is it that if uh, so much were to change for women that, that, that the regime would crumble? If you could just you know, lay out uh, what that means to you, and then tell us a little bit more about is this pillar really eroding from the inside now, and what are women doing, and, and what more can they be doing? Thank you. Yes, I don't have a question. I just wanted to quickly tell you that I was one of the people who had the pleasure of meeting your foreign minister when he was here. And I say pleasure because he was absolutely delightful and very popular here in the United States. And one of the things he said to me that made me laugh, but it, was, it wasn't that funny really, but he said that Iranians will always be grateful to America because we killed number one enemy, Saddam Hussein. Uh, all right. <laughs> I'm really shocked. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of people were hopeful that this is the time uh, for the Supreme Leader to compromise and help the economy grow. I mean, of course, there are so many opportunities. Uh, Iran is a huge market for American investors, a uh, population of 80 million, most of the middle class. Uh, it's good for American investors. And it was, there would be so many opportunities for Iranians. Uh, but you know, um, I think I, I was just reminded about who the Supreme Leader is. Uh, when he was appointed as the Supreme Leader, uh, he was Iran's president, and he was actually a moderate man. He was a very uh, moderate president. He had allowed uh, his uh, foreign minister uh, and uh, Khomeini to make most of the decisions, and he had uh, served a more ceremonial position. Uh, he was a cleric, but he had smoked the pipe, which is not acceptable for a cleric. He, he has a passion for music for reading novels. Apparently, he has a huge bookshelf uh, with uh, translations of every novel. And uh, he, he's read them all. Um, he has uh, a passion for Persian uh, literature. Uh, I mean, when he came to power, I remember that uh, we were Iranian, ordinary Iranians were very glad that he was appointed because we thought that meant Iran would uh, move uh, toward more moderate policies. And then the president was Akbar Rafsanjani, who was clearly a pragmatist. Uh, but when you listen to his talks, uh, it shows uh, what happened to him. And in, in one of his talks, he has said that he changed uh, after he was appointed as the supreme leader. And he felt that there was a huge responsibility that was put on his shoulders. And he was in a position that he had to safeguard the revolution. And when you think about it, uh, this man ha has been um, doing everything in his power since 1989 to make sure that he is safeguarding the revolution. If he wanted to look at the interests of the country, or if, if he wanted really to uh, pursue what he believed in, he could have become the leader of the reform movement. And that would have been the legacy that he could leave behind, the man who uh, changed the revolution, he, who reformed it, who made Iran a more moderate country. Uh, but instead, he has done exactly the opposite. He, he feels he is 
uh, responsible to safeguard uh, the revolution that Khomeini left behind in, in the same, uh, in, almost in the same uh, uh, way that it was. And he has gone so far that he alienated the clerics who, was close to, who were close to Khomeini and had been part of the revolution. And instead, he has empowered the Revolutionary Guards and the militia force to safeguard the revolution because he knew he would never earn the respect of more senior clerics. He was more junior to them. And uh, he is doing everything uh, to, to safeguard the revolution. So I, think he, I don't think he looks at the uh, long-term interests of the country. He, s he sees it as his mission uh, to, to make sure that nothing happens to the Islamic Republic as long as he's alive. And then Marie's question about, I must say, I have on my sheet here, the three pillars, animosity to the U.S., animosity to Israel, role of women. I put two question marks there. Why is that equivalent? So thank you for that question. That'll be the last question, okay? <laughs> well, you know, when Khomeini came to power, a lot of people guessed that he's going to make women wear the veil. And part of it is, was because what Reza Shah had done in 1963, I think, uh, he had forced women to get rid of uh, the, the headscarf. And a lot of women, a lot of uh, the majority of the population were traditional, and they hadn't liked that. And for clerics, uh, it was an insult because he had undermined their power. They they urged women to cover their hair, and then the leader, this uh, the king, came out and uh, forced women to get rid of uh, their headscarf. So when the Islamic Republic was created, a lot of people guessed that Khomeini would go as far far as forcing women uh, to to wear the veil. And there was a guy, um, uh, Mutahari, who wrote an entire book called Hijab, The Veil. And the entire dress code is, is described uh, in detail there. And this, he wrote this book way before uh, the victory of the revolution, how the coats should be, what women are allowed to show and what they're not allowed to show. I mean, even details about the sounds of women's high heels. I mean, everything was uh, you know, written down there. So it was part of a plan. And after the revolution, I mean, we have the picture of a woman on the cover. And uh, uh, Alex, my editor, is here. Uh, I, I didn't want to have a picture of a woman in the chador on the cover because I thought it was such a cliche, but in, both inside the country and outside the country. Uh, if uh, you see a picture of a woman without, uh, without the veil, would you guess that this is a woman in Iran? Or it could be a woman in Turkey. It could be a woman anywhere in the world. Women and what they wear have become the uh, walking symbols of the Islamic Republic. On that note, um, I, uh, well, let me tell you something. She, as well as she writes and talks, she writes even better. <laughs> and I would encourage you to buy the book. It's a wonderful book. I'm going to hold her here so she can sign the books of those you buy. But uh, Nazila, I can just tell by the reaction of the audience, they've been fascinated by you. I certainly am. I'm so delighted you came here. Thank you so much.